Hey, in this 30 minute ish video, I'm going to show you my personal Photoshop workflow, the how and the why for one of my own favorite images. I'm going to discuss my thought process and approach from start to finish for a fine art architectural landscape of the Chateau de Chambord in France. I will take this image and make this one. You will learn object removal techniques, advanced retouching, global and local contrast adjustments with levels, masking and dodging and burning and keyboard shortcuts to make you faster and more productive. So you know the question. Are you ready? It's Photoshop time and you know the drill. Smack it, whack it, and crack a lack. Yes! That's awesome! What? So first, let's start with some context for this image of the Chateau de Chambord. It's a castle that was commissioned by King Francis I who loved art. This 16th century castle is the largest castle in southern France in the Loire Valley. It sits on 13,000 acres now. It's 13 stories high and it has a width of almost two football fields. It has 440 rooms, 282 fireplaces and 84 staircases, all of which is owned by the French government now. Leonardo da Vinci even had a hand in its design, which again is a great example of French Renaissance architecture. It took over 28 years to build and ironically was only lived in for about a total of seven weeks over a 20 year period. And then it stood vacant for over 100 years, falling into disrepair. And then roughly each century, some new owner would renovate it and repair it and bring it back up to date. In 1939, shortly before the outbreak of World War II, all of the art collections of the Louvre and the Compagnia Museums, including the Mona Lisa and the Venus de Milo, were stored at the Chateau de Chambord. It has a presence, is my point. This shot of mine was taken about 16 years ago in a Mamiya RB67 with T-Max 100 film. This was right around the era that digital was just starting to take a foothold, but not of the affordable quality that we have today by any means. Essentially, memory cost for like an inexpensive point-and-shoot camera, like a 512 megabyte card that you could buy for like $3 today, cost about $512. Like it was literally a dollar a megabyte. Obviously, in this time period, I decided to go shoot with film. Now the RB67 back then was considered to be the commercial photographer's premium camera. It was the biggest negative you could get before stepping up to the next level, which was a 4x5 view camera. Remember Ansel Adams shot with 4x5, mostly 8x10 view cameras. But it was still heavy though. It came in like around six pounds. So imagine holding a gallon of milk every time you wanted to take a shot and you only had 10 shots in your camera at any one time, and each shot cost you $3 and a half at every click of the shutter. So let me show you where I started from. I'm from the Midwest United States, and I flew to France, directly to Paris actually, rented a car, and then you have to drive to the Loire Valley, which is the southern part of France. Now let me click on this satellite view so that you can see it as I zoom in, because I want you to get a scope of the size, and I'm gonna show you actually where I stood to take the photograph. Just so you know, you can grab this little person and drag them over to any of those hot spots. Drop in and go view any parts of this. Actually, I'm gonna have a, like a little 20 second walkthrough of this photo gallery, which is just has mind-blowingly beautiful, huge images. Even though there's paintings on every other floor, you as, as a visitor who doesn't have to fly to France to see it, you can walk through it virtually and see everything that's there. And I, and I recommend that you do that because it's just so inspirational to see what other artists are making around the world and, and how powerful their imagery is. But anyway, so, I'm going to drop the person over here right on the second level of the northwest facade. And this is looking out across the courtyard. You see the moat right here in the middle. This is that other side of the moat. And this is where you were just standing right up here. I just wanted to give you a scale. Taking a look at this overall, I'm going to grab the little person again and drag them way over here. Now, this is about where I was standing when I took the photograph. Yeah, this part's really sad. None of this was here before. None of this urban modern architecture, none of this construction. Construction. This is the point of view that I was just showing you in Google Maps. So this concrete wall didn't exist when I was there 16 years ago. You definitely couldn't rent paddle boats and there weren't golf carts. There's a big tree that's missing that gave me that beautiful foreground framing for my image. So what I shot 16 years ago literally doesn't exist anymore. You can't capture it. Nobody can, even myself. So first, I'm going to make my icons in the layers panel a little more visible to you. I'll click on these disclosure lines, go down to panel options, and I'll choose thumbnail size and I'll click on the larger icon and that'll make them just a bit more visible for you. Generally speaking, whenever I start out with an image, I always duplicate the layer so I'm never working on the background. I do that by hitting Command or Control J. And so now 
I can do whatever I want and I am not destroying the original background. So I'm gonna add a blank layer by clicking on this add new layer icon. And I wanna show you some of the problems. I clicked on the foreground color to open up the color picker and I'll choose red. Remember I'm on a blank layer. So as long as I have my brush, I can mark this up. Now notice what happened. Even though I chose red, it came in as a gray. Well, that's your first indicator that this whole image is set up as a grayscale mode, which you can actually verify up here by, by looking where it tells you the mode and the bit depth. I can also go up to image and mode and and I can see that it's grayscale. One of the reasons for this, because obviously if you're pretty far into black and white conversions, you know it's a great benefit to capture in full color because that gives you access to the red, green, and blue color channels to make your luminosity adjustments after the black and white conversion, which is really powerful. This is, as you know, is RB67 negative that was black and white to start with. So there was no reason to do that. I will convert this temporarily to RGB though. Don't flatten so that I may mark it up. I don't think these lines are plum. Pull over the ruler and you can do that by hitting command or control R so that to make your rulers visible and or like you would think intuitively you can go up to view and put a check mark beside rulers because you want to view the rulers. But again command or control R will activate them. And then if you click inside them you can drag down horizontal and vertical lines to test if your image is level, if the architecture is plum as in perfectly vertical. Typically there's always a little bit of distortion especially if you're up close to a building and you're shooting up. I'm pretty far away from this building. All right, so I see that I need to correct some, some line distortion. Is this whole bottom area is underexposed, right? Visually, I feel like this building isn't exciting. I may or may not remove that. I definitely don't like the fact that this guy's here or this sign is here. And more importantly, if I want this photograph to be more timeless, essentially this particular boat to me stands out. I think I should remove this entire boat. These rowboats look believable. I wouldn't these plastic containers aren't of the time, right? So I'd want to remove those things. And then obviously I need to brighten up this foreground and I need to darken this background. So essentially I just have some fairly general tweaks. So imagine if you're Gregory Crudson, you know, he's the contemporary photographer that sets up his photographs the way people build movie sets. Like he has crews of 20 to 60 people and he has boom cranes and he constructs houses and cuts them in half. And he does all of this to stage a single shot. So if you were Gregory Crutzen and you had that kind of unlimited budget where you could stage this, I would have somebody move this boat before I took the photograph. I'd have them remove this area. We, as the public, were not allowed down into this area. There's actually a guard right here to prohibit people from getting down there. Uh, so I had no ability to do that. Photoshop, it gives me that kind of unlimited creativity to reimagine the scene as I would want to see it. And that's what we're going to do. So first thing, let's Let's tackle something easy. Let's remove these plastic jugs. I hit the command and space bar and click with the temporary zoom tool and zoom in. Then release the command key and just hold the space bar only so I can temporarily access the hand tool, slide it up to a better view. One of the first things I think I would like to tweak is again, getting rid of these. And I think my first attack would be coming up to the spot healing brush area and choosing the patch tool, make a loose selection around the objects I want to remove. And then I'll click inside there and pull it to where I think I can remove it from. So right here looks good. Try that. I didn't do bad. This little line over here doesn't quite match up. I hit Command or Control D to deselect. Oh so yeah, that, that part's an issue. If I hit Command or Control Z to undo that twice, I could try this another way. And what I could do is just go back to my Any Selection tool and just pull the selection over. That's that same shape, right? Hit Command or Control J to duplicate it to its own layer. So there it is. And now I can hit the Move tool and just click and drag this over. And now I've got a little bit of flexibility where I can incrementally tweak stuff with the up and down arrows. I can hit command or control T and then rotate it a little bit to match that angle that's there. That has some good things happening. Left arrow key, right? But I'm not getting the blending that I would really uh, want. So here's where you've got to now manually blend it. Adding a layer mask, getting B for the brush. Looks like I can go in about that far. There's the edge right there. So that's pretty close to the edge. I'll hit X to reverse my colors. Tweak this little bit. I want to see where the bottom is here. And I'll X to 
get that back. I'm getting pretty close fairly quickly, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to click back on this top layer, add a new layer, and I'll hit S for the clone stamp tool, and I'll tell it to sample from all layers. So the, the way you access this tool is you have to hold down the alt or option key to target where you want to paint from. So I'm clicked right here, make my left bracket key smaller. I'm at 100%, and that's going to let me paint out from where that little plus sign is moving. That's where I'm sourcing my, my material from. I'll, I'll make a smaller brush. I'm zoomed into 141%. I think I'll command spacebar drag just so I can have a bit more control. Typically, I say never really go in past 100%, but I I, previously, I've made this print as large as 30 by 40. So I know it's an important image, something that I'm going to print really large. I will zoom in a little little tighter just to really pin down uh, my painting efforts. Now, I'll alt or option click on this side, get rid of this part. I'll release and start again. And then I'll hit 5 for 50%, click back on this side, essentially make a bigger brush. Just want to soften that edge a little bit like that. And then I'll space bar to move down, alt or option click on this side, left bracket key to make my brush smaller, and just kind of paint that way. Same thing, I'll click option click right here, pull this line over, option click here, pull that up. And I want to go back to 100% because I need this line really to be pretty, pretty crisp. Pull this all the way across and I'll command zero to shrink this back down. Command one just to see it at 100%. It's looking good. Uh, there's a little bit of dis discoloration and oddness happening right there. So we need to fix that. By all means, fix it. Get rid of that little curve. And now I hit five for 50% because I need to kind of integrate these colors that are different or these tones. Come from this side and go backwards and zero. Yeah, that's going to work out just fine. Now, while we're here, we might as well grab the spot healing brush tool. And I don't know what that is, but it's visually distracting. I wouldn't consciously put it there. All right, so I'm not sampling all layers. So let me sample all layers. There we go. And I'll space bar and just pan around, see if there's anything else I want to get rid of. Now here, depending on how picky you want to be, I would say that this this rowing, this ore holder wasn't there, you know, hundreds of years ago. So maybe I would get rid of that just by painting over it with the spot healing brush tool. Get the clone stamp tool, option click right there, kind of come across. Same with here, kind of come across. Space bar to move around. Maybe this will be another spot to remove. I know that I want the numbers on there even. Maybe I could, I could definitely leave the chain, change back then. So I'm going to go around and just remove all of these. Okay, so I got rid of all of those little ore holders and the numbers, and now I'm ready to tackle the next big problem, which I would suggest is this anachronistic boat. It uh, really messes up the, the time period, as in this could have been taken in the earliest times of photography, and everything could be as we see it. Even the clothing the person's wearing looks probably believable of that time frame. But this boat, that's that's definitely not making it. Alt or option click, you can see all the, the stuff we retouched out come back. Now at this point, I would push all of this to its own layer by hitting command shift option letter E. And then I would go back to this retouching stuff and select both of it. Hit command or control G to group it. Double click to inside the, the root label to rename it and turn that off. So again, this before and after. Hold down the command and space bar. Zoom in by dragging. So now I'm going to spend time removing this. And some of this I'm going to have to recreate because there is nothing to clone from for this bottom part. Like there, it's all camouflaged by other boats. So I'll copy and paste and probably hand paint this bottom part of the pier, the concrete pier. And I'm just going to use a variety of techniques. So I'll start since I'm on this duplicated layer. I'll add a blank layer and I'll make sure it says sample all layers. And I'll start with the spot healing brush and just see how it does. Let me paint over this awning. It's not bad at all. I have to go back in and fix some brick lines. I'm just clicking and painting. Now remember if you click once and hold the shift key and all the way down, it will automatically draw the straight line for you. Usually it doesn't do good when you cross a border like that. So for this situation, I would come in with the phone stamp tool, alt or option, click down here, right bracket, you make my brush bigger and just crisp up that line moving up there. Same with like, see how this line disappeared? I go ahead and alt or option, click and kind of bring that line back at 100%. And I could probably do some of that here, painting from over here, kind of draw that brush bigger and from further back. Just make sure I get that line and keep it all symmetrical. I'm just painting straight down. You see the plus sign moving, telling me where it's sourcing from. Now I don't want that extra pier post, so I'll reset that. Now I can start from here and I'm going to select that line. Notice I'm getting that I'm getting some repeated lines. So I need to come further back, make a bigger brush and just kind of break some of that up so it's not so similar. 
And I'll do the same thing for the back of the boat. I'll hold an option click there, line that line up right here, you know, with the dark part where the concrete meets the water and just keep clicking over, kind of creating and then just paint. Luckily, it's going to mimic everything we're pulling from base bar. Yeah, so ultimately that's going to look like, that's going to look like the shadow from here. And again, I can soften that by hitting five for 50% and just softening this, this uh, edge a bit. I'm just going to paint with the red. I feel like that line, the bottom of the pier, will come right around here. So that's essentially what I'm trying to work towards. So I'll come back here. So essentially, I'm just clone stamping this out and sourcing some material and free transforming it to fit. Go to view and down to clear guides. So as much as I was trying, I think I've warped this. So what I'll do is I'll just lasso select it, command J it to get it on its own layer, command T it, and I'll just kind of pull it back a little bit, make it more up and down. Clearly, I need a layer mask, and I've got to go back and fix this area at 100%. So I added a layer mask, and I'm going to go to the gradient tool and just drag. The longer the line, the softer the gradient. The shorter the line, the more harsh the gradient. You can make it go perfectly vertical or horizontal by holding down the shift key. I'm going to do something like that, and that's kind of giving me a nice gradated line across here. I like this foreground. Some of it's a little too bright, but otherwise, I, I, gen I generally like it. I'm going to duplicate that layer and call this one background, and I'm going to go to this layer mask and hit invert to invert invert the relationship and I'm going to grab this image from the very bottom and actually pull it on top, pull this layer mask up and delete this one. So this way, this is an untouched castle back here. So now I can select that, go back to camera raw and only focus on manipulating the castle. And remember, it's doing stuff to the bottom, but I don't care. I'm not really looking at that. I'm trying to really just focus on on the castle part, trying to get rid of some of that noise from this. Well, it's probably grain or problems with a negative over there. I like that. That's going to get me in the right direction. That update, and I'll name this castle. Let me push all of those to the same layer by command shift option letter E. All the things we've done. So remember, here's where we started. Pretty flat negative scan. Retouched out. This is my duplicated later. Then we retouched out all the little stuff, boat or holders, plastic. Then we removed the boat, trying to maintain the proper reflections. The the correct curvature of the concrete wall trying to we had to remanufacture this entire line and I still don't like this line right here so I probably will need to go back and integrate that a little better and then we brighten the bottom part manipulated the top part the way we wanted it and compress all of that to its own layer in and of itself so I think these two group them hide them at a layer mask B for the brush X for black in my foreground just to make this not that much dark 40% just to make this a little darker just that area in the water. So again, I'm going to push all of this to its own layer. I'm going to select everything now, put it in its own group. So I can quickly look back and say, okay, I started here, ended here. I like where this is going, but I want to make some changes. Let's add a levels adjustment layer, click the black point eyedropper. And let's say I want to push all these leaves to silhouette. I think I like that one the best. So I'm going to push all of that to its own layer. You notice that's a common thing with me. I'm going to select everything, put that in its own group, kind of like Inception. I keep throwing things in groups and groups and groups so that I can simplify my layers panel. Typically, I name everything so that I can come back and find it later. Now I want to hit Command or Control J because I'm going to pop over the camera raw filter and then look at this as its own separate image all by itself. What would I want to do to make this stronger and better? I don't know what's happening here. That needs to be fixed. I think I'd like to stretch it. Right now it's at a four by five aspect ratio, which is one to 1.22. So I'd like to stretch it out a bit more. I'll do that in Photoshop. Essentially, I'm just going to go back and manipulate the clarity a touch more, the texture, the dehaze. Fortunately, that clarity is really mucking up that sky. So I don't know that I can do the clarity and the texture any more than I have because of that problem. Remember, if you drag the clarity to the left, it's going to soften it. So I guess I'll probably stay somewhere right around here. Let me check and see if a vignette is appropriate under the effects. Maybe a little one. Got the photojournalist in me, so I tend to like to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit S for the clone stamp tool, and I'm going to sample right here because essentially I just want to paint it 100% and I want to get rid of probably something from a scanning artifact. And then I'll probably at least go into 100% and pan around the sky and see if I can minimize some of this noise. Maybe I can try to do it with the spot healing brush, almost like it's blemishes. Just the most distracting parts. It's actually doing a really good job. And again, I would only spend time on this if it were a portfolio quality image, something I'm, I'm wanting to look stellar, the big print for a client, you know, a big canvas print. But again, if it was one of my signature images on my website, which this is one of my favorite images, and I would go in and it's like, I don't even know what that is, but I find it distracting. So I would minimize it or remove it. Any little layering dots or bots. Let me pan around. Yeah, I don't know what they are. I'm going to have to hit S with the clone stamp tool and maybe click on this side, brush smaller, line up the, the lines, just kind of paint that out. 
out, whatever that is, and then do it from the other side. If I can even it up, come back, smaller brush. I'm just kind of getting this part. Maybe I'd want this guy to be a little darker. The move tool, leave it on shadows. And I'm just going to push him, push him in this whole area. So I'm going to start with mid-tones, push him in this whole area down or for 40%, multiple clicks. Really want to pull this down. I don't want the viewer's eye going here. And I'll go to shadows. I essentially want to push him almost to a silhouette. Maybe this grass, I'll pull down a little bit, use it more as a graphic element. And obviously by doing this, I'm going to have to get rid of a lot of those uh, white patches. The quickest way for me, I believe, to get rid of these little white splotches, which are fallen leaves. So I'd come over to the spot healing brush, adjust my brush size, left and right bracket to go smaller or bigger, and just paint over them. So I'm going to do that really quick right now. Okay, so I've quickly removed those distracting elements. Now let's look at the image as a whole by hitting Command or Control Zero to fit in the screen. So as a whole, What's now attracting my attention are these little sheds are too dark because remember we did a gradient mask. So that mask came in front of the sheds, making them a bit too dark. So I want to select those and put them on top of everything and adjust them to where I think they balance more with the range of tones from the foreground to the background. So I go all the way back to the original image by clicking on that background layer, command space bar to click and drag to zoom in, L for the lasso tool, and it's the polygonal lasso tool that I'm using, the second one that's inside the lasso tool disclosure triangle right here. The way you use the polygonal lasso tool is you click and then you drag to the next point and click and it creates a straight line that will eventually be a selection line. And then you click back at the end. And now I'm just going to hit Command or Control J to duplicate it to its own layer. Click and drag that layer to the very top. So I'll turn that on and off. So you see how I now have the original kind of very flat image there, but now I can adjust it. I'll add a levels adjustment layer. Now remember, if I don't clip it and I make any adjustments, it's going to adjust the entire image, right? So I need to hold down the Alt or Option key and hover between the adjustment level layer and the layer below, and my cursor will turn into this symbol. I'll click, and that downward arrow means I'm only now affecting just that house. So I can very easily adjust the subject contrast of an image. So for me, it needs more contrast. It needs dark, some darker tones, maybe open up the mid tones a touch. Now it's hard to see so up close, right? So I hit Command and Control Zero to, to see it in the scope of everything else. So too dark, too flat. Yeah, we're getting there. Darker, dark, something like that. I think I think that looks really nice. Command space bar to zoom back in. Now my selection was very harsh, right? Let's take a look at that. The edging is specific because I didn't feather my selection tool. See up here in the toolbar, I could have chosen a, a feather selection, but I didn't want to do it there. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to command or control click on that, add a layer mask, and I'll drag the feather of the mask down. Remember, you can alter option click on the mask to see. See how much I'm feathering that mask? Just to just so it's not so crisp. That's all. I like that. I'll space bar to get the hand tool to move over. Need to do the same thing for this one. So I'll go back to the background layer, grab my polygonal lasso tool, and quickly select and jump this to its own layer. And once I have it to its own layer, I'll just drag it up above everything else. And there it is. Now, what I'm going to try to do is to reuse the lighting that I did with this adjustment layer by holding down the Alt or Option key, clicking on it, and dragging it above. You see the cyan line telling me where I'm dropping it. Now, remember that applied it to everything, so I still need to reclip this to the new tower. And the selection for this one is not going to work as well as it did for the other, which is no problem at all. I just need to readjust it. Command zero to see it in the scale of things. It needs a little more white. It needs to be a little darker. And this is all to taste. But remember, here's where we were, and I like this better for sure. Probably I would go in to this image, I mean, command spacebar again just to zoom in a little bit, and I've selected the actual image that we duplicated, and I would use the burn tool just to locally come in and make sure those shadows a little too much. Command Z, hit one or 10%. 10% is actually a lot for a shadow burn. I'm going to click there, hold the shift key so I can get straight lines. Again, I am just manipulating the local subject contrast of this particular image. And zero. Yeah, I like that. I think that fits in nicely. Now they are a touch flatter than the surrounding rocks. So that's where I need to kind of decide if I want to come back and increase the contrast of them a bit more by shortening the range of tones by dragging the white and black sliders a little closer, maybe somewhere around there. And I'll do the same thing with the other one. Yeah, I feel like that fits in the scene really nicely. So what I'm going to do is collapse all this to its own layer by hitting Command, Option, Shift, Letter, E. And I will put these adjustments we just made into a group to hide them. Let's see where we were. See the difference? 
Remember, painters step about six feet back from their canvases to get an overall view of what they're doing. Photographers and Photoshoppers should definitely do that by fitting the image on screen and reviewing it. Okay, now what's what should be altered or edited? I feel like the building's not plumb, and that could have something to do with the actual architecture itself. So I'll zoom back in. I'll hover over the rulers and just pull a ruler over to the side. Yeah, that's not really level. I'm sorry, that's not plumb. Plumb means what level means, but for up and down. See, this, this vertical line is not lining up at all. So because it's a scan, Adobe Camera Raw would not be able to pick up on the camera data that might have skewed this. And again, as I said, this could actually be more a factor of that it was built hundreds of years ago. But let's try. I'll go to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. It's under the Geometry. I'm going to click on Vertical Fix Only. Horizontal Fix. There's Automatic. There's nothing. All right, so the Automatic was able to identify the vertical lines and kind of straighten them out. This straightens, focuses the importance on it being level. This again focuses it on it being primarily vertical corrections, and this kind of does a, a blend of both. I think the blend of both looks nice, and I'm going to leave that. So let's see where we were. Uh, that definitely straightened it out. See how that looks pretty visually straight. So I, I actually like the direction this is going now. It's just about deciding what you as an image maker want to do and manipulate. Like I personally feel like the windows in this area over here is kind of flat, like the window area is flat. I mean, obviously it's getting hit by a bit more direct light, but I would still like to come in here with uh, the burn tool with shadows, maybe hit three for 30% and really make this look a bit more dramatic by increasing the D max of the deepest shadow parts. And I'm just painting on each of those and I will make a pass over these windows. And now I think I would go in and grab the dodge tool and dodge the midtones, make a big soft brush just to make the building a touch brighter, give it a bit more local contrast, pull the viewer's eye mostly towards that. A few clicks here and there, work in the spires in that top, trying not to get any halos in the sky. And then I think I would suppress this building in the back. Instead of cloning it out, just go back to the burn tool and choose highlights and 20% by tapping two and just push this down a little bit. It doesn't need to be so dramatic back there. Go to midtones, push it down a little more, and then go to shadows and push it down a little more. So it's still there, but I've de-emphasized the importance of it in this image. And now you just paint with light by dodging and burning to steer the viewer's eye where you want it to go. Probably going to burn the shadows of some of these leaves to make them a bit more rich in their blacks, pass over this top structure. So now that I'm done with all that, I'd pop back over to the Adobe Camera Raw filter, adjust anything where I may have gone too far. Like, do I need to pull the exposure down just a touch because it was getting a little bit too high contrast? And that, again, this is to taste, but I want to pull up a little more clarity, dehaze it just a touch, but maybe go back and lower the contrast overall subtly. And I think that's, that's my image. So now I go to view, clear the guides, hit the tab key. When you hit the tab key, it hides your panels on the left and right side so you can see it just on a clean, crisp gray background. Helps you figure out exactly what it is you're seeing without all the, con the visual clutter. And I like this. The only thing I would consider exploring right now, remember this is an RB67 scan negative, which means it's a four by five, which is a one to 1 1.22 ratio. It means I can print at a four by five ratio. I can print eight by 10, 16 by 20, 32 by 40. But let's say either me or my client wanted uh, a little bit more of a four by six. So that could be, that could be an eight by 12. That could be a 16 by 24 four, a 32 by 48. It just depends on you know, the size you ultimately want to output. I'll hit the tab key again to bring that back. And just to try it, I'll command minus once. I'll choose the crop tool and I'll choose a ratio of four by six or two by three. Hit these arrows to swap it. I'm going to pull out kind of evenly. Hit enter. All right. So that's the one thing right there. Remember, I've got 20 steps I can undo. So this is just me trying it out. So I'm going to hit command or control T. I'm going to grab my bounding box and I'm hold. see how wants to enlarge everything, I want to stretch it. So I'm going to hold down the shift key so that I can stretch it. I'm not a photojournalist, so it doesn't matter to me if this is 100% accurate. It's more about the feeling of the art itself. I'll hold down the shift key and drag this side. Okay, now what I notice is visually, even if you've never been to this castle, for me, everything to the left of where my mouse is, this whole 80% of the image looks believable. For some reason, this little part right here, probably because it was the closest to my lens originally, it it looks distorted. It looks like it has been skewed. So what I would do is I'd command or control Z to undo that last skewing. Maybe I'll just slide this over 
and just skew from this side, which is skewing the entire image. But most of the skewing is happening in a kind of a linear fall off scale closer to the point that I'm skewing from. So see how this isn't as stretched looking? And I hit enter, V for the move tool, command zero to fill in screen. So now it's totally my call. Like, which do I like better? I'll hit uh, command Z, command Z, and I'm already back to where I was. So I hope this has helped in seeing an actual start to finish case study of how I would approach black and white conversion and a high end retouch to really reimagine the scene and the image to be exactly the way I want it to be. Can't wait to see what you do. Take care. Yes! Oh yeah, here's the uh, photo gallery thing I was talking about. So remember to drop the little person and trial and error, you'll get there. Just choose the appropriate floor. This is the zero four. There's that spiral staircase I was talking about. And this is the first floor. And I'm just clicking on the far right hand side where it says 210. And you can walk through these rooms by clicking on the floor. You can walk through doorways, basically like you're actually there and you're seeing everything in 360 degree panorama just by using your mouse. And this is the second floor right there in the center of the building. And this is a big photo gallery and it's just full of beautiful, beautiful images. And I'll kind of pan this around. There's that continuing uh, spiral staircase and see where I'm clicking. I want to click right in front of this piece because that looks beautiful. And then I'll just click and drag to turn the view around. And then I'll click further down. Those little X's give you targets. And then I'll click and drag this around just to look at it square. And you can see there's another hallway down there where we can go look at images. And this just goes on and on and on. And there's so, remember, 440 rooms in this castle. And it's all about art. Definitely go check this out. Yes! Hey, what are you still doing here? It's over. Actually, all kidding aside, I hope this video helped. And if it did, consider subscribing. I like subscribers. That's awesome. What? You just took one in the jugular, man. <laughs> Whoa! Yes! <laughs> god. Oh my god, I did! This is hey, you stayed to the end. You know what that means. You're awesome. I'm talking about you. Now get out of here. <laughs>